Hello, Warwick. Hello, listeners. Hey, Nick. How you doing? I'm really well. How are you? Oh, I'm fabulous. I'm sure we'll be even better after your cracking joke that I know that you've done three and a half minutes research on. I like this one. Uh, so, Warwick, what do reindeers say before they tell you a joke? No, don't know. This one's going to slay you. Okay, I'm dying over here. Oh, no. I'm literally dying. <laughs> I didn't make this one up. So let's make that one up. Thankfully, Christmas is over. Well, it's not really. really? Christmas is more than just a day. It's It goes for about six weeks, I think, for most of our listeners. Yep. There's the lead up. There's the manic period beforehand. Then there's the in betweens bit, which is kind of weird because are we on call or not? Did we tell our clients to leave us alone? And then there's kind of New Year. It's like, oh, my gosh, are we through it yet? Can we start another year yet? <laughs> so Christmas is this massive... Uh, month and a half or maybe even two months for many people. Mm, it's a big time. Puts a big strain on business and relationships and cash flow and I think leaves a few people feeling exposed, Coxie. Okay, and for some people it's a lot of fun and joy and festivities. <laughs> but Not we're not here to talk about fun, joy and festivities today because <laughs> – we have we have a guest with us again today, and uh, we've actually heard from today's guest a couple of times in a couple of different forums. Um, our tradiepreneur clients love today's guest. Um, well, I think they love what our, our guest does for their business. <laughs> um, so, Helen Kay from Rise Legal, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. Pleasure, pleasure. Now, you did speak at our uh, Tradiepreneur client conference recently. Yeah, well, it doesn't cool. feel that recent. Mm-hmm. It was a couple of months ago now. Um, and the feedback was fantastic. Uh, I thought you gave a great presentation and we love your values and everything. Um, so, we've had a few of our conference guests on the podcast lately. Yeah. Um, so, it's a great opportunity for you listeners to hear from some of the expert guests and the the speakers that we line up for our Tradiepreneur clients each year at our conference. Um, So, Helen, you're obviously going to talk about the absolutely fabulous topic of law and protecting yourself and (laughs) written agreements and fine print and all that stuff that we'll get into. But can you tell our listeners a little bit more about you, the person, Helen? Oh, my goodness. Because lawyers have feelings too, right? But yeah, we do. Lawyers are people too. <laughs> you didn't realize it. Some of them, maybe, well, some of them are a bit dodgy, but um, yeah. So I am from England, like you can probably tell from my accent. I didn't um, notice. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's gone, it's gone now. I've been in Australia 16 years, totally gone the accent. But um, I was actually brought over by one of the top law firms because I had a particular set of skills that was needed. Um, and that was in buying pubs and nightclubs. Hmm. So I actually came over, I was brought over um, to Perth um, to buy, if any of you drink Little Creatures beers, I was brought over to buy um, uh, a building next door to Little Creatures Brewery in Fremantle and to deal with the state government on all of it. So very proud. Just come back from a visit to Perth and went over there and it's it's still there. My uh, my walkways are still there and fabulous. But um, As I was sort of working in the industry of construction, acting for state governments, acting for big developers like Multiplex, Mervac, um, John Holland, Lendlease, all of those people, I saw a real niche, a real hole in the market for the um, the subbies that were coming in. So obviously, you know, those great big developers had fantastic um, internal uh, in-house legal departments. Mm. They also had really great external law firms like ourselves. So they just had the best legal advice that was available. Mm. And the subcontracts that we were getting out to the subbies, um, they often weren't employing lawyers. Mm. And I could see there was a real imbalance there. Um, but there was like a an imbalance in, you know, the the sort of the people who would act for those. Mm. So that's when I kind of thought back in 2012, you know, there's a real niche here to actually help these guys, to help the tradies, the people who really need it, the people whose um, families are dependent on this income. Mm. Mm. And that's when we started Rise Legal and we've we've specialised in helping tradies. We're the tradie lawyers. Love it. Nice. It's a hell of a turnaround from beer to tradies, or maybe it's actually no, it's not a great connection. Part at all. I think that would make a great conversation piece when you're talking to tradies. <laughs> 
And do you know what's great as well, Nick, is that um, I often see documents that I had a hand in preparing for the developers. Yeah. And I can actually ring the in-house legal teams and say, can I have the other version? <laughs> a friendly version that doesn't have the termination for convenience clauses, that doesn't have the liquidated damages. And it's just sort of knowing it. So you, you get, you know, I've been I've been on one side and now I know exactly how the other side thinks. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a minefield. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't understand legal jargon and I've had a lot of opportunity to learn it, unfortunately, over the last 10 years or so. And it's just not my field of, it's not my expertise. It's not my field of learning despite some of the life lessons um, and it really pays to have someone in your corner that can help you unpack what's happening. And I think one of the conversations that I've had time and time again through a very hard lesson that I learned myself is obtaining that advice early is far less expensive than waiting until you've got to flick the button and, you know, mm-hmm. really obtain some very solid advice and start to make a plan. Doing it early and, and setting yourself up to mitigate as much risk as possible is really the key to ensuring that we have the most successful outcomes, whether you are a homeowner going into a contract or you are a tradie working with a homeowner or a builder or a developer, um, there are opportunities for you to set you up regardless. Helen, what are some of the mistakes that you see frequently when you start talking to trade business owners? Yeah, really good question and completely agree with what you just said as well about the uh, being proactive. Mm. I think at the conference I did um, mention that and used a few analogies it's a bit like you know the, in the medical field don't wait to go and see a doctor until after you've had the heart attack yeah. actually go and see one and say am I likely to have a heart attack in the next five years based on you know my cholesterol my habits and let's do something about it now and that's where I kind of sit in the whole let's do something about it now before it's this mega irreversible issue mm-hmm. in terms of the mistakes gosh it, Pretty much like if I was a betting person, I'd be very, very rich because I could pretty much say, you know, I bet this person hasn't done this, this and this. And it's not, you know, I'm not being like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, this amazing person. You know, I make mistakes in my business as well. But um, the biggest things we see um, a lot with tradies, particularly in the first couple of years, is just that setup. So, you know, get an ABN, easiest way to do it, um, and then go down that route. Now, that's really not a great route Mm -hmm. to go down for various reasons, Um, mostly because you you pretty much, you know, the analogy, I'm very visual, the analogy is you've got all your assets in your backpack. You know, you've put your title deeds to your house in there, your car keys, everything, and you're saying to the client, here's your protection. I'm going to do a good job because you can Mm -hmm. sue me and take all of this. You know, company is the way to go, without a doubt. Obviously, seek financial advice. And nothing that I'm saying today is going to be um, advice. It's going to be very general in nature. But that's one of the mistakes we see, their initial setup. And it can be quite hard to unravel it a bit later, you know, because of, you know, QBCC and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, We also see that so many people, so many of our tradies just don't have any contracts. And by contract, I don't mean this big, scary thing that master builders, producers or anything like that. I'm talking contract is quote terms and terms and conditions. And a lot of people are just, they're getting the quote bit, right? But they're just, and then they say, oh, but I've got payment terms on my invoices. Mm -hmm. Too little, too late because they've not, the client never accepted them at the start. Mm -hmm. That's a huge one. Um, You know, people are doing work over those thresholds of 3,300, 5,000, depending on what state you're in. And actually by law, you need a contract. So if you have a problem with the client, the client doesn't pay, client rings fair trading, you're in the wrong because you didn't have the contract. And it's such a simple fix, as you guys know, because we've helped, you know, so many of your members get this right. Um, Subcontractors, huge one. You know, you've got these people coming in and they're not necessarily invested in your business. They've got their own business. Care factor, you know, could be very low. And, you know, work quality low, et cetera. And, and this is where we really do feel like we need an agreement. These people could steal your clients. They could do a bad job and disappear. So I would say out of all of them, I know I gave five mistakes at the conference, but for this podcast, three, those three are the top. Mm. I think a lot of it just comes from a lack of education because um, there is no business education when you finish your apprenticeship. It's just do your apprenticeship, work for someone for a while and think oh, I could do a far better job of this than they're currently doing and then jump out and give it a go. But unfortunately, unless you have some of those learnings or opportunity even for learnings, you can find yourself in hot water long before uh, you even realise what's going on. Some of these things are very easy to slip into. Um, Helen, 
what sort of things do I need as a as a newer business owner? What what obviously I need to be thinking about the the entity, the way my business is set up. What else do I need in place just to make sure that we're covered and at least, you know, even just on a basic level as a starting point? Yeah, really good. Um, what you need is what we call the essentials pack. So um, you know, finding a good tradie lawyer that can give you the essentials. The essentials are those terms and conditions. Let's just get some terms and conditions and a really good quote template that you can send to your first client, second client, even call outs, you know, let's get them so they can go out, um, you know, even as a hyperlink. But there's two other documents that people forget about that are really useful. One's a privacy policy. Now, under Australian law, you do have to have a privacy policy if you're collecting client information. Mm -hmm. That's a legal requirement. You don't want to be found um, lacking in that respect. And website terms of use, we have had some of our trading clients who've had website content copied and having being able to prove that that person has, you know, breached those website terms of use can be so useful. There's so many copycats out there at the moment. <laughs> it, it's just like, guys, come on, come up with your own name, design your own website, do your own thing, stay in your own lane. But it's getting, it is getting worse. Mm. Believe me, we're seeing the worst of it. You don't want to be on the other end of a copycat because it can be really stressful. And for that reason, if you're setting up, have a really good think about what you're going to trade under. If you trade under a name that's different to your name, you have to have a business name. Yep. But that's not enough. You need to make sure. I would really love it if you could make sure that it's trademarkable, which mm -hmm. means that it's not descriptive. So we're not talking Gold Coast Gardener here. Mm -hmm. We're talking yeah. something, you know, really, really unique. And you start building up goodwill. So people talk about that name. They Google it, they find you. We don't want them Googling it and finding someone else. If you've got a trademark and that happens, you can swoop on that other person. Mm. So I think we uh, we do a brand check for people who are sort of coming up with names and we'll give them, you know, give us a few names and we'll tell you, we'll give you a rating one out of five, which one we think is the best name. We also make sure it's not infringing somebody else's because that can be huge, mm. you know, and there's, there's some law firms out there that will just swoop on you. Even mm. if their clients don't have registered trademarks, they'll swoop on you and say you owe our client 50000 as well as changing your whole brand. It can be a really costly mistake to set up with a brand name that's either you know, too close to somebody else's or not trademarkable. Unfortunately, I've seen that happen. It wasn't a very pleasant yeah. outcome for either party really in the end. Um, Helen, what, why, why can't I just go online and copy and paste somebody else's that they've already had done? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had oh, a dollar yeah. for every time we've been asked that, Coxie. <laughs> it's not very nice. No. And also, um, yeah, it, it, there's copyright. I mean, there is, there's laws on copyright. Somebody else prepared that, that information and it's theirs and they own it. But, um, yeah, it would breach. Most websites you'll notice on the bottom have a banner. And most of them should have at least two hyperlinks, one's to a privacy policy and one's to website terms of use. If you go on and copy someone's content, you've just breached those website terms of use, which is a contract between the website owner and the visitor. Mm. And likewise for terms and conditions for my contracts or my payment terms, et cetera, if I copy and paste them, is that breaching a copyright mm. there as well? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And there's, you know, we put confidentiality in as well. I think I saw in a forum the other day somebody was really peed off Trady had spent ages quoting and then um, I'd had it emailed back to yes. her. Did you see that one? Yes, yeah, someone had it emailed back to them and they said, can you beat this quote? And so they're obviously sending it out to all the competitors in the area. And it's like, there's a simple thing, you know, this is confidential. So actually, you know, our terms and conditions can't be shared. There's people sharing them in groups as well. Oh, hey, has anyone got some terms and conditions? But that's like, <laughs> I don't know, terms and conditions for an electrician in uh, Perth are going to be very, very different to, you know, a, a cabinet maker in New South Wales. Absolutely. And it depends on the type of work you're doing, mm -hmm. the state you're in, and your practices. Mm -hmm. you, know, you might not want to be taking 20% deposits because you can't. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Exactly. I did, I think I mentioned at the conference, you know, sharing legal documents is like sharing needles. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a good idea. No. <laughs> Just don't do it. I was thinking sharing, you know, life partners, but hey, let's go with the <laughs> the really scary one. Both are pretty dicey. Hey, both one. both cost you a lot of money. Yeah. <clears throat> oh dear. So I mean, so much of this is is about the fact that preparation and prevention is cheaper in most cases than fixing stuff. And our tradies get that. You know, they 
they would recommend to everybody that they get regular maintenance done on their plumbing. And actually, we've got a tradiepreneur who picked up a large account um, and <laughs> the the business is having all of these uh, problems because they haven't been doing their regular maintenance. Uh, and the maintenance would have cost them a lot less than all the replacements and the repairs that they're having to do now on this particular property. So um, why do you think it is that <laughs> people don't do this stuff, Helen? I mean, Google's full of information. It's easy to go and diagnose my own health problems these days online. Uh how come people avoid the prevention stuff and getting these things put in place? Yeah, it's a really great question. And do you know what people tell me all the time? They say to me, we didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have said to me, we knew we needed this stuff. We just didn't know where to go. And to be quite honest with you, there just aren't many law firms out there that are sort of reaching out to tradies and mm -hmm. saying, you know, we, we understand you. We understand your pain points, your industry, and we can help you. Mm -hmm. People just haven't, you know, a lot of law firms... And we've seen evidence of, you know, people who've said, oh, we had the law firm draw up some terms and conditions for us a few years ago. And I look at them and I think, that's like retail online sales terms and conditions. That's got nothing to do with a tradie going into somebody else's property mm. and carrying out work, you know, that is regulated. So, yeah, I think it's just not knowing where to go. Um, so that's why we're trying to get out there as much as possible and say, look, you know, we're tradie lawyers. We can help you. We get you. We love our tradies. Like, we, and it, I'm not just saying that, like, as soon as, you know, we've not had any issues touch wood with any of our trading clients. They're just genuine salt of the earth and we love helping them. It's definitely challenging. I think, um, again, as I referenced earlier, this isn't my area of expertise. Often we don't know where to start or who to speak to first. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to have, obviously, places that are, are actively targeting specific industries and business. Um, and I think that there needs to be some questions that people ask that they make sure that the person they're talking to understands it because they're going to read those terms and conditions and not really understand the difference because they're uneducated in that part. It's really quite complicated. Mm -hmm. Are there some questions, Helen, that you would like your clients to ask you when they first start speaking to you? To me? Well, the, yes. I mean, most people find us through, you know, great conduits like yourselves, you know, people who who are known and trusted already, which is great because it's got rid of that, um, you know, needing to validate. Mm. But I think we, I always do explain a couple of things when I speak to clients and I sort of give them some help as well. I'll say to them, look, if you are phoning around other law firms, which is fi absolutely fine, you know, your clients are getting three quotes. Why shouldn't you, if you're getting some services, that's fine. And I also give them some tips and I'll say, look, one of the biggest tips I'll give you is to ask them, do you do fixed fee billing? Mm -hmm. because what we see a lot in the legal industry it's still quite old-fashioned in certain areas we do see lots of um, what we call fee estimates mm -hmm. and someone will say oh yeah that'll be 1500 bucks but actually when the costs agreement comes out it basically says that you know this is the charge out rate for all our different levels of lawyers and what they're doing is they're running clocks in the background and then come to the end of the matter or the end of the month you'll get a bill for however long it's taken. So this bill that says email, email, phone call, perusing document, amending document, you know, very anyone who's had lawyers will, will be able to resonate with that. And it can be a bit of a surprise, which is why I do recommend people do ask for fixed fee lawyers like ourselves. You know, I've been doing this for 23 years. I know how long it would take me and my team to do these things. And I know how much, you know, is a reasonable value added price. So that's a good one. And then another thing to ask is, do you regularly act for, insert your industry, insert mm. your location, do you regularly act for electricians in Perth? Do you regularly act for builders in New South Wales? Mm. That, that would be my, and if they stumble and go, oh, well, you know, a contract's a contract, you know, that kind of thing, then you know you're not in the right place. Mm. The yep. website should be obvious as well. There should be lots of, content geared towards tradies and and you know subcontract agreements mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing i think another one of the fears is around the cost uh, i think it's pretty common because again we're uneducated and we're all brought up with the f same fear in the media that we hear from tradies every tradie you see on tv is a crappy tradie they're never good ones mm -hmm. and every time you see a lawyer on the television it's to do some great big um, legal dispute and it looks really expensive they've got beautiful suits <laughs> and carry expensive briefcases and get out of designer cars and you know it just feels really expensive and yet um as we've already said it can be so much more expensive to do it after the fact 
Is there, um, you know, with fixed price billing, that's fantastic. It's very clear and open. I guess they don't understand what to expect is another big part of how to get over that first hurdle. Uh, is there a way that they can become more educated around what to expect in terms of pricing for some of these um, protection devices that you can help them put in place? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it's just asking those questions, but for, but making sure that when you do get quotes, so even if you have found a fixed price lawyer, that the scope's really clear because, um, like, for example, our scopes make it clear that we will take instructions, we'll prepare the draft, we'll send the draft to you, we will then book in a free call, we will then make any amendments afterwards so that, you know, if you've seen stuff you didn't like or just had an afterthought or something you want to add, um, what can happen a lot is um, law firms can produce a document and then kind of go, that's it. That's all you get. You get the document we've sent you. Yeah. And there needs to be some input from the client. This is your document. This is how you're presenting yourself with your quote to your client. Mm. So I think just asking those questions and just being just really checking the scope. And if it's not clear, if it just says prepare terms and conditions, just ask those questions. Do I get any input into this? Do we get to have a chat about these? Can I make minor amendments? Mm. And if they come mm. back and say, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but that'll be extra, then you know that that wasn't really a true fixed fee because mm. it was just a fixed fee to get their bit done. Yep. So, that's yeah. right. <laughs> and no question's a bad question. Like people say, oh, you know, sorry, I'm sound really stupid or something. No, it doesn't, mm. doesn't sound stupid at all, you know, and, and law is changing, thank goodness, and the mm. way in which legal services are delivered um, we're becoming, and we should for a long time ago, become more like trusted service providers than people who sort of put themselves on a pedestal as being, you know, some sort of experts. As you know, I, I don't resonate with any of that. So I, I always say I'm not a proper lawyer because I don't wear the suit. <laughs> not a proper lawyer. I'm well, not was... a proper lawyer. I don't go to court. Um, that's my strict line in the sand. I try and keep I keep people from going to court. And the litigators hate me. I put clauses in which would make it very hard for people to go to court as a first a first instance. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't drive in, in in posh car. I I own a Jeep. I love my Jeep and I'm never getting rid of it. I don't care. <laughs> I think it helps just that uh it's to dispel the fear. It is so yeah. much more expensive to do it after than it is in the first instance. Um, but then of course it's finding those people that you can trust. So understanding, I guess you have to arm yourself with a basic understanding and, and that is a great place. Google is a great place to start. Mm. I would be using groups in a different way. So some of the things you and I would both see in common are very much around that sharing or getting advice from somebody that doesn't have a clue through their own experience. Often they'll share. That's not necessarily right for you either. However, you could use groups to ask, well, what kind of questions should I be asking? What should I be looking for, et cetera? is a great place for you to educate yourself on. So you've got some knowledge when you start to talk mm. to somebody that can help you prepare what is necessary. No different than a homeowner will most often Google to get an indication of what's wrong or what they need fixed or what to expect with the cost of something so that they have some understanding before they call a tradie to come and fix a problem. Um, I think as business owners, we need to do the same and, and at least somewhat educate ourselves so that we don't have to feel like the wool's being pulled over our eyes and that's going to remove yet another barrier. Mm. Yeah, informing ourselves is really important, Coxie, um, which is why we do this podcast. Yes. Fancy that. Helen, I've got uh, – I don't really want to call it the penultimate question because that kind of indicates that perhaps this is the only question anybody needs to answer in their entire life, and it's so not that. Uh, <laughs> but if you had a 1,000 tradies in a room, what's one piece of advice you would love to leave them with? Oh, I would just love to say to them, add, add a good tradie lawyer to your team. Mm. Just mm. have a good tradie lawyer there even if you don't see the need for them at the moment, because um, like Coxie said, you know, you, you might not have an issue or you might perceive that it's just, just get that, you know, when you're setting up your power team, you need your business coach without a doubt. You need your accountant, your bookkeeper. You do need a lawyer as well. Just, just to have that conversation with them and say, look, I'm starting a business. Uh, look, I might not need you yet. You know, my accountant's doing the structure, you know, wait until I've got a few clients, but what do I need? Mm. when I'm ready and get that lawyer to sort of say, well, these are the things you need. Like we talked before, you know, the essential legals pack, um, checking the brand. You, your accountant won't check the brand. We we do that as a service for accountants. But I think just having that person that's, you know, you know you've got them there, I think that'll give you some peace of mind mm. to go, if there's ever an issue or when I'm ready to be proactive, 
I've got the exact right person. So I'd find that person and, and add them to your, your important contacts list. Absolutely. It's like the, uh, the triple treat accountants, lawyers, and business coaches. We just, you just can't run a business without them these days. And no. I do say that slightly tongue in cheek and actually mean it because mm-hmm. I'm sure you would be the same, Helen. We all see businesses that do have, um, those three key people on their team. And I guess you could add in the bookkeeping as a fourth, um, if it's not within the accounting firm and their life is a lot less stressful. They have a lot less problems. Uh, you know, they avoid a lot of conflict because they've done the right preparation. They understand, uh, I guess as a business owner, what decisions to make in their business. So, um, I think that's really important advice, although it's general in nature listeners. So just a reminder, (laughs) do not act on anything from today's podcast without seeking your own advice. Uh, You can go and speak to your own team, your own solicitor, or uh, if people want to find out more about you, Helen, I'm guessing they just go to riselegal.com.au. Is that the best thing to do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got a Facebook page as well. Um, We're always hanging around in the group. So we're always there if anyone needs us, if you want to tag us. But awesome. yeah, and yeah, just that point you made about that power team, um, just mm. add into that, you know, there's a reason why the government, um, when you buy a franchise, for example, or when you enter into a, a retail lease, there's a reason why the government sends you off to see a financial advisor, a business advisor and a lawyer, because mm. the government themselves have realized that those are, that's the advice people need, those three tiers. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. All right, gang, uh, go and inform yourselves. And uh, if you haven't joined our Facebook group yet, um, we'll just change the name of it. Cox, I did just but... change the name. I don't okay. know. <laughs> I can't remember what no, we've I've called got it. it. It's called Tradie Business Help. Get free business coaching and other stuff. stuff. Just, <laughs> so just if you want, search for Tradie Business Help. If you want Tradie Business Help, go find our group on Facey and uh, you can hang out with a bunch of other trade business owners there. Helen, thanks so much for your time again mm-hmm. today. Um, it's a pleasure talking to you. I love how simple you make all of this sound. And uh, our clients tell us that you make it simple. So um, thanks, Heath, for your time. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Helen.